All right. Uh, we had talked about throughout the semester what to do if there's invalid data. And my answer was always something along the lines of, we're not going to worry about that right now. We'll worry about that later. And now's the time, now's later. <laughs> so now's the time for us to, to worry about that. So uh, I'm going to look, uh, we're going to look at what are called exceptions today. And if you've had C sharp, you know that exceptions are very similar in C sharp than as they are in Java. In fact, most of the programming language of C sharp is very similar to Java. So let's go and let's download a couple examples and go from there. An exception, in short, is an unexpected and probably unwelcome uh, simple way to put it is something went wrong, all right? And there are exceptions that occur as part of the objects that you um, use, like if you tried to divide by, by zero, you would get an exception. Uh, if you try to reference an object and that object has not yet been created, you get the very common no reference exception. Well, these things are, are such that the program cannot continue to execute. So if you're expecting to be an, there, there to be a valid object in an object reference variable, and that object doesn't exist, you can't do anything more. You can't call methods on the object, you can't do anything. And therefore, the application needs to stop, all right? Unless, and that's what it will do if you don't have any exception uh, trapping in it. Um, however, you can write code that will handle exceptions or handle the problems. And then you tell the program what to do if you run into this problem. Let's look at my examples here. Let's look at the first example. And I'm going to go into my command line. All right, let's look at what these classes do. There's just a single class in this example. And it I'm creating an array list. Right? Let's see, first of all, what happens if I don't have any of these tries and catches. I'm going to just delete this stuff out. All right, what this is going to do 
Let me run it through first. And then we're going to intentionally mess it up. This just creates an array list. And I create two elements. This is an array list that accepts spring, uh, stra uh, strings. And I create two elements for this array list, hello and goodbye. And I add it to that list. And then I'm going to loop through I equals one to list.length. And I'm going to output the length of the word. So I'm going to make this a working program first of all. So let's save this and run it, and we can see what it was intended to do. And not find. Okay, no errors. What am I doing? I added these two strings. I'm going to loop through, ignore the comments, and I'm going to print out the length of each of the elements in that array list. So I should get five and seven, it looks like, if I'm counting right. And sure enough, I get five or seven. We played by the rules, all right? So it worked and there were no problems, no exceptions. Now, let's mess this up. I went from list from zero to, to the size of the list. So that would go as long as I was less than two, which was the size of the list. What if I try to go up to five? All right, that's a mistake, right? Why is that a mistake? Because there is no element sub two, sub three, and sub four. There's only element sub zero and sub one. Therefore, something bad is going to happen when I try to execute, uh, access the third, fourth, and fifth element of this. Let's see. What happens? I get the five and seven, so I was able to process them, but I get an exception. And this error message is pretty clear. This says index out of bounds exception. Index two is out of bounds for length two. In other words, if an array list has two elements in it, then you can't refer to uh, element sub two, right? Only elements sub zero and one exist in that array list. So this is an exception. There's another exception. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to null out elements sub one. So I'm going to assign null to element sub one. I do my same loop here for I equals zero. I is less than five, I plus plus. Only difference is I have in here the second time through the loop when I has a value of one, I am going to set that element in the array list to a null. And therefore, what is it going to do with this? I did this error specifically because this is a very common error. Not generated this way. I mean, you can see that this is code that's not good, that it's written specifically to create an error. But in more involved programs, sometimes you have a case of 
an object that you think would exist at a certain point when in reality it doesn't. So if I compile this, I get a different one. It processed the first one, but then it tells me exception and thread main. Java Lang, no pointer exception. A no pointer exception means that you have an object reference that does not reference to an actual object in memory. And in this case, list sub one, I've nulled out. So there is no object on the other end. There is no string at position one. And therefore I cannot ask for the length. So notice what it does. It just, it, it, it dies, the program dies. It can't do anything more. In fact, it doesn't even continue to try to do two, three, four, because as soon as it gets an error like this, it can't possibly continue. The program has no idea what to do with this, how to handle it. So it throws an ex it, it, it does what is called throwing an exception. All right. And two things in, in an exception can be handled two different ways. One, you can write code to handle it, or two, the Java virtual machine is gonna handle it. And the way the Java virtual machine is gonna handle it is by shutting down, all right? It's gonna shut down that program. It's going to give you an error message. So for example, let's say you had a, a, a program that was processing uh, people that entered data into a screen and there was a place for age and someone typed in letters in that field. Now I know there could be some validation for that, but let's say there's an ex exception, all right? Uh, let's say that there, there could be an exception uh, thrown. If you try to take the value of that string and turn it into a number, it would be bad if every time someone made a keying error that the program simply died. A much better thing to do would be to display an error message saying, hey, age can't be, or age has to be a numeric field, and then give them a chance to re-enter it. So that's what we wanna do. Sometimes we're simply gonna report the error, sometimes we're gonna report the error and give some instructions about how to handle the error. Okay, so I'm gonna delete these and I'm gonna go back to what I had originally. I'm going to go and expand the zip file. All right. So we're back and this is exception one again. Now we have try catch block. And the way try catch blocks work are like this. Now, this is a very simple example. I only have one statement in my try block. The Java virtual machine is going to try to execute that statement. If it executes successfully, great. It will go on to the next instruction and the next instruction and the next instruction. If, however, an exception is encountered, and these catch statements kick in. So depending on the kind of exception that we get, if it's a null pointer exception, we can display this. If it's an index out of bound exception, we can display this. When it catches the exception, it's gonna stop processing. It's not gonna continue on 
to the next thing and so on. If there were additional instructions after this. So let's imagine in our head what we think this is going to do. We have our loop in here. The loop goes from one to 100. There's clearly not 100 elements in here. So we're going to get a lot of indexes out of range exceptions. We clear out one of the items by nulling it out the way we did in the previous example. And so we're going to get this exception once as well. Okay, let's compile it. Let's run it. So sure enough, this did what I predicted. It displays the length of the first element, which is five. The second element, the one at position one, we nulled out. So it's going to dis uh, display that there's a null string at position one. And for the rest of them up through 99, it's going to say invalid index at position two, three, four, five, all the way to 99. Do you see how that works? This loop is going to execute 100 times. I equals zero the first time, all the way through I equaling 99. It's going to increment by one each time. We clear out element one. We try this statement. For element zero, this statement went just fine. And we were able to display the length we got here. For element one, however, we cleaned it out and therefore we, we cleared it out and therefore we could not execute this statement. We threw an exception. Now we named the exceptions that we're looking for. The reason we did that is we wanted to do something different in each case. In one, I wanted to print one error message, in another, I wanted to print another error message. So here, which one of these exceptions is it when I clear it out and put a null value in it? It's this exception, a null pointer exception. And it's going to output that. For the rest of the iterations through the loop, this is going to fail because there is not an element two, an element three, an element four, an element five, all the way through 99. So we get this 99 times. The try catch is included in the loop. And therefore, the loop is going to execute its determined number of times. Now, I don't have to name a, a specific exception. I could do something like this. In which case, since I'm trapping for an exception, I don't know exactly what went wrong. I'm just looking for any kind of uh, uh, exception. So I can just say in my message, something went wrong. And again, because I only tested for exception, it's going to catch any exception and display this message, regardless if it's a null pointer exception, index out of range exception, or any other kind of exception. Now, what happens if we test for an exception, but don't test for other exceptions like this?
I'm trapping for a null pointer exception, but I'm not doing anything if there is a any other kind of exception. Well, that will be well, we'll we'll show you first and then we'll talk about it. Process the first one correctly because there's nothing wrong with that. Item one, it threw the exception. It caught the exception and did something with it. For item two in that array list, that subscript is out of range, but we're not catching that exception. Therefore, again, someone has to handle that exception. Since we are not handling it, we don't have a catch for it. Uh, the the uh, Java virtual machine is going to catch it and is going to display an error. All right. Now, that's why a lot of times you will do this at the end of a catch block. You'll say, "Hey." there's any other kind of exception, do this. Now, we don't know what kind of exception that is. We just know that it's not a null pointer exception. So the null pointer exception knew and displayed that because this we have code for the null pointer exception. We don't have code for any other exception though, and therefore we can only display something's wrong about it. Now we, when I, we can get actually more information about an exception. The exception is an object and we can get the properties. And what this says is that whatever exception gets thrown here is gonna be put in this variable E and then we can do something with that variable. So let's look for the exception class in Java docs. Java docs are like the official documentation of Java. You may find any number of sites that might help you with some information but this is like the official uh, documentation. So you should get used to reading it. What this tells us is that Java doc inherits from throwable because we can throw exceptions and it also inherits from the, the base Java object. It implements the interface serializable, which we're not going to talk about right at this point anyhow. Some of these we're not interested in right at this moment, but we can get and see that we can call a two string method on it and it'll give us a short description of the exception. We can say get message and it will display the message for that, a detailed message. So let's put some of that in. We can call the two string method. We can call the get message method. Or we can call what's another one, get 
get stack trace. Now we're doing, we're just outputting these. We could have our application create an error log in which we could write these exceptions to if there's a problem. So instead of just displaying on the screen like we're doing here, we could actually have our program write out to a file and then that might be uh, that might be uh, something that uh, a programmer could review at a later date and they find out the program crashed, they can go back and look through and try to recreate the error. I typically wouldn't display these messages to user. I would come up with users. I would come up with a more user-friendly sort of error. That's the message I displayed. This message is the two string. It's telling me that it's a null pointer at one. This is the message. And apparently there is no message for this exception. And this is a stack trace element, which uh, shows a memory location in the Java virtual machine. Again, some of these could be useful in debugging a problem. So let's summarize. Exceptions are essentially something went wrong. We can put instructions that have the potential of something going wrong in a try catch, uh, in a try catch statement. The try contains all the list, uh, a list of uh, instructions in a sequence, and the catch kicks in whenever an exception is thrown. We can either look for a specific exception, we can look for several specific exceptions, or we can look for a generic exception. And depending on how it's set up, we get the appropriate error messages. We can also use that exception object to do stuff with, uh, like, for example, write to a log file. Um, and we would want to, excuse me, we would want to provide a user friendly message if it all had a, a user sort of interface. Let's look at the second example exceptions. Here I have a triangle class. This actually has a small bug in it. Maybe I'll talk about it. Here is not something going wrong with the built-in Java objects, but where something goes wrong with an object that I create. For example, looking back to the pizza example, if we created a, well, let's go back to the school example instead. If we created a course and it had negative credit hours, then that would be a problem, right? That would be unexpected, something went wrong because a course can't have negative hours. That would be a problem. We would want to throw an exception, all right? So we're not talking about like the, the ones that are built into Java, like the null object pointer uh, array uh, index out of uh, bounds. We're talking about something that we put and enforce in our, we're going to want to enforce in our code. So I have simple, a simple triangle class. What do we know about triangle classes? Well, what attributes do they have? They have three sides. 
And for simplicity to, uh, sake, I'm going to uh, make it such that uh, they're integers. Here's my constructor. I'm going to look and I'm going to call the set methods for each of these. So I call the set method for side one. Notice we've modified this function to say that it can throw an exception. So in this case, we're looking at the value of the argument. And if the value of the argument is less than one, we are creating or throwing a new exception. Now, an exception that is thrown either needs to be caught or thrown back to whoever called this function. So in this case, if I were to put in a value of negative one, negative one, negative one, this is gonna have a value of negative one. I call the set method. The set method is going to look and it's gonna see that the argument is less than one it's going to throw an exception. This function throws, defines it is going to throw an exception. It throws it back to the constructor who also throws the exception. So whoever called the constructor is going to get that exception and they're the one that's going to handle it. Or if not, the Java virtual machine will handle it and the program will crash. I do this with each of the three sides. If any of them are negative, I throw an error. Notice how I said way, uh, way back a couple weeks ago that my constructor calls the set method. That way we only need to put the validation in one place. All we have to do on the constructor side is to identify that, yeah, a possible exception could come from this. And we have a choice of either handling it in the, in the constructor or probably more likely throwing it to whoever called this constructor. There's also another way that a triangle could be invalid. And that would be if the sum of two sides is less than the third side. All right, what do I mean by that? A triangle couldn't have sides of 1, 10, and 50, all right? That would not make a legal triangle, all right? How do I know that? Because the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. So what I'm saying is from point A to point C is 50, yet from point A to B, is only one and from B to C is 10. So that would be one plus 10 is 11. That would mean if I went from A to B and then to C, that would be shorter than going directly from A to C. So that's not valid. In other words, if any of these cases are true, if side one it's greater than the sum of side two and three, or side two is greater than side one or three, one plus three, or a side three is greater than side two plus side one. Then I have another exception. We're, call, we're call, throwing just an exception. We're throwing the generic exception and we're initializing it with a message. So that whoever calls this and gets this exception, if they catch it, they can display that message. So let's look at our unit test. First thing I do is something kind of goofy. I say that I is a new integer and the value of the integer is contained in the string hello. Well, that's not possible, right? 
So some problem is going to occur. That's not right. So an exception is going to be thrown. Let's see how we handle this, this, this exception. So let's look at that first before we look at the other steps. So right off the bat, line eight, we know it's going to give us a problem. All right, this gives us, uh, this is a warning message. Uh, it's not really important uh, for our purposes here. I run it, the unit test. Okay. We get a message saying Java Lang number format exception for input string say uh, value of hello. Code specifically written for the number format. Okay. So how does this work? This instruction runs. It throws that number format exception. Is it a null pointer? No. Is it a number format exception? Yes, it is. We're going to display the value to string, and then we're going to display or write whatever code we have when there's a number format exception. Now, we'll create our triangle, then we're going to set it immediately to null. So what's going to happen if we try to, to calculate the perimeter of that? We're going to get a null pointer exception, and we should get e to string, so the exception to string function, and we should get a line that says code specifically written for null pointer. Sure enough, we get Java null pointer exception, and then there's our code specifically written for null pointer. But what if we don't do any of this nonsense and we just have a valid triangle? Well, it's going to go and it's going to calculate the perimeter. Because none of those exceptions are going to occur. Perimeter is 24. Is that right? 6 plus 8 plus 10 is 24. Sure enough. But what if we do this? Is that a valid triangle? Six, size six, size three, and size 10. Well, six and three equals nine. And the other side is 10. So 10 is not greater than, or 10 is greater than the sum of the other two. That's not right. Because if it was right, it would be easier to go from side one to side two to get to that point instead of taking the 10. So this is going to throw this exception because 
in our case, side three is going to be greater than the uh, side one plus side two. And sure enough, it's going to give me an exception. But again, notice this. It's not a null pointer exception. It's not a number format exception, but it is a it is an exception. So this code is going to process. It's just not one of those two exceptions that I had expected and coded for. Now, the problem with this is we can't differentiate between what error we're getting for a triangle. Both some of the sides being incorrect, and if the amount is negative, it's going to always throw an exception. It would be nice if we could create our own exception type, and we can. We can define a class that inherits from exception and call it a triangle exception. Doesn't do much, it inherits from that. The only difference is that when we give it a string, it's going to call the super classes uh, constructor and set the value of the string. But then we can test for it. We can test if it is a triangle exception or some other kind of exception simply by saying that we want to create a triangle exception. Simply by creating that triangle exception and by throwing it. We throw the triangle exception if there's any problem with the triangle. And that way we can know that the error came from the triangle and not some other kind of Java, uh, general Java exception. I mentioned that there's a bug in here. The bug is that I test the sum of the sides in the constructor, but I do not test the sum of the sides after we change a side. So I could, if I defined a triangle correctly, then went back and changed the values of one of the side, I should do that check again and make sure that it is still a valid triangle. Uh, the sizes, you know, add up the, the right way. Now, notice where my catches are. I, so my quote business logic classes, like the triangle, throw exceptions but don't catch them. My unit test catches the exception because every program that runs that uses these classes might want to handle certain exceptions differently. If this was a batch process where we processed a whole bunch of triangles all at once, we might write a, an error to an error log. If it was an online thing where we had a user interface and someone was keying in the, the, the size of these triangles, well, then we might want to display a message on the screen. So we can handle the errors differently uh, if we catch it in the calling program. So either our unit test or next week when we start to study UIs, there's going to be where the catches lie. There should not be any catches in our business logic classes.
There's one more thing I want to go over for today, and that is enumerations. Enumerations make it easy to define when there's only a certain specific set of values that an attribute can take. For example, in the, in the uh, Pete's example, uh, right, the, the sizes could only be small, medium, and large. And we didn't do anything to handle that. Well, what we can actually do is we can define an enumeration like this, we usually make them capital so you can tell that they're values from enumeration. We say that this is the only values that a pizza size can be. Then when we declare the variable, we don't declare it as a string, we declare it as a type of pizza size. So we're allowed to put in an enumeration for the type of variable it is. Then when we test it, we would say things like if size equals to pizza small, size equals to pizza medium, size equals to pizza large. And when we call it to initialize those, we would have to set it up this way to initialize it. That would be how we would create a new pizza with the size of large. But if you can imagine, like, you're probably not going to have a text box for entering in the value of a pizza. You're probably going to have radio buttons or a drop down. And each one of those drop downs can, uh, it can correspond to one of the values of the new enumeration. Try running this and getting used to how this works and maybe make some pizza of your, pizzas of your own to get into, uh, you know, what, what the issue is how this works. Do you have any questions? All right. That's all I have for today. Uh, either uh, we will see you in lab or we will see you uh, next week.